things I don't like. Bad people taking advantage of the weak. Good people down on their luck. Innocent people suffer. Talk to God a lot. Sometimes he talks back. So I ask him, when are you going to do something about all this? You know what his answer was? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. My name is Habakkuk. This is my story. Difficult to answer. I mean, if you think about it, um, why do we say that our alarm clock is going off when it's really coming on? Or why do we talk about driving on a parkway, but then we park in our driveway? Or how about this one? If I throw my cat out the window, is that kitty litter? I would never do that. I love my cat, so don't hate me. I've never thrown a cat out a window. But kind of, all of this kind of reminds me of the book in the Bible that we're up, about to begin to study because every time my cat coughs up a fur ball, she, she says the name of this book, Habakkuk. Some people call it 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 Habakkuk. I call it Habakkuk. Really... Uh, we don't really even know how to say it. It's not even a Hebrew word. It's one of the few words in the Old Testament that's not in Hebrew. But you can uh, begin turning to Habakkuk now. We're not going to read there yet, but it's going to take you a while to find it, probably. It's uh, one of the obscure minor prophet books there in the Old Testament. And when I came across this series, I felt really impressed that this is what the Lord would have me to share at this time. It's called When God Seems Unfair. Because if we're honest, sometimes the things that God does and the things that He allows seem unfair to us. And everything that's going on in our world today, I think we could have easily called this series Trusting God in Times of Difficulty, or When Life Doesn't Make Sense, or When Life is Hard. But the bottom line is that's what we're talking about. Sometimes what God does or what God allows doesn't seem to make sense to us. It doesn't seem fair. It's not pleasant. It's not, and it, it makes us wonder why. You see, Habakkuk asks this very hard question of God when he says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? I, I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Someone said, uh, I was mentioning, uh, talking to someone this week, and they said, uh, you know, I, I found out you were going to be studying in Habakkuk, so I read Habakkuk, and it reads like today's newspaper. It's very relevant to everything going on in our world today, and people even today ask the same kinds of questions that Habakkuk asked. God, why is, uh, why is it that evil people seem to prosper? But the good people, um, all of these bad things happen to them. Why is it that I, that I work hard and I'm honest and I try to do a good job at work, but then it's this jerk over here who gets promoted instead of me? Why is it that uh, someone who's not even uh, a good person, not even a righteous person, they live to be 102 but the person who is faithful and caring and is a good parent, they die of cancer in their early 40s. What's up with that, God? And how come I've got all of these headaches and they don't go away? Or how come I'm battling with depression? Or how come someone I love is going through all of these very hard things? God, it seems like you could do something if you wanted to, but you don't. Why? Why don't you seem to answer? Why don't you seem to care more? This series is for everybody who's struggling to have hope in a world full of chaos. And it's my intention over the next few weeks to 
uh, lay out some biblical truths that really become like tools for us as we seek to find hope even when life is hard. Now, first, I want to take a moment and, and just set some background and context for the book of Habakkuk, because Habakkuk is, is one of the 12 minor prophets It's found in the Old Testament, and they're minor prophets because they never made it into the majors. They never got that big contract signed, right? No, no, we call them minor prophets because they're basically just because they're very short books. They're small books, but they have a big message. Habakkuk is only three chapters long, but it has this very deep and profound and helpful message for you and me. Now, Habakkuk lived and served about 600 years before Christ was born. And when he's writing, it was a period of time in the nation of Israel of really great decline. And this is where we're getting into that newspaper stuff I was talking about. Uh, it has become a horribly wicked place. The government was violent and was unjust. They, they oppressed righteous people. The government, uh, they oppressed the poor. People had become, just in their own interactions, very brutal with one another. There was violence. There was abuse in homes. There was abuse in the streets. There was corruption and dishonesty. It's like reading today's newspaper. Now, I want you to read this with me. We're going to begin reading in chapter 1 and verse 2. And I want you to follow along as I read together. And we see for ourselves how this true servant of God, a person of genuine faith, but still they struggle in their faith. And that's, that's one of the takeaways of this message, that a person of deep and real faith, that doesn't mean that you don't have questions. And it doesn't mean that you can't be honest with your questions, at least honest with yourself and with God. Let's begin reading in verse 2 of Habakkuk chapter 1. And here God's word says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even uh, cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity or injustice and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. He said, that's what I see when I look out around me in society. I see plundering and violence. There's strife and there is contention that arises. Therefore, the law or the government is powerless. And justice never goes forth. Justice is not being done. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, uh, perverse judgment proceeds or unjust acts proceed. You see, Gen uh, Habakkuk is genuinely struggling. Why is God allowing terrible things to happen to seemingly good people? Why does God do, why doesn't he do something to stop so much evil going on, especially against people who are in the right? He's distressed and he approaches God and he begins to ask God the very same kinds of questions that we're asking today. You see, Habakkuk was, um, he was a prophet, but he was a different kind of a prophet because I, most prophets, they spoke to God on, uh, they spoke to the people on behalf of God. God would say, thus says the Lord to them, and then they would go out to the populace, and they would say, thus says the Lord. So they would deliver God's message to the people. But Habakkuk wasn't quite like that, at least not in this writing of his. He, he, he didn't do that. What he's doing is he's taking what he sees the people experiencing, and he's uh, bringing that to God. He's bringing a message of what he doesn't understand about what God is doing to God on behalf of the people. There is this complaint. There is like this lament of all that's going on. And why isn't God doing something? And he takes that back to God. You see, uh, there's something that he is seeing that doesn't seem to fit in his worldview. It doesn't fit with the goodness of God. And that's the tension that we find, especially here in chapters 1 and even chapter 2. God, you don't seem to care. You're letting all these 
uh, things go on in a world and it doesn't seem fair. God, uh, you're not doing as much as you could. You could, I, I believe in your power, I believe it, that you exist and that you could do all kinds of things, but you don't seem to be doing them. God, I don't know why. Now, is that, some people might ask, well, is that even a good thing to say to God? Is that like legal God talk, right? You, like you, someone talks that way and you kind of step out of the way because you don't want the lightning bolt, you know, to have collateral damage. You know, there's just like a black spot on the ground where they got smoked by God for questioning God. But again, here is an individual who is obviously a servant of God, who is clearly a person of deep faith. But in their faith, they feel this tension and they bring it to God. There's a lesson in that for you and I. Have you ever found yourself managing that tension? And if you haven't yet in your life, let me assure you that you will. You will find yourself in these kinds of places. And you say, boy, Pastor Phil, I sure am glad I came to church today to get all of this encouragement from you. Let me just say right here that this sermon and perhaps even this series, this is not a sitcom kind of a sermon. You know, let me just give you that warning because, um, you know, we all know what, we've all done a lot of watching of sitcoms over the years. I remember, you know, when we were kids, we used to watch um, um, the Andy Griffith show, right? You still watch the Andy, Andy Griffith show or the Brady Bunch, you know, here's the story or Gilligan's Island, right? Or um, some of the really cheesy ones like Green Acres. I can't even bear to watch that. And then there was that other sitcom. Oh, yeah, my parents didn't let me watch that one. But what happens in a sitcom, right? There would be a little bit of humor. There, it would start out with a, a, a tension of, of some kind of a problem, a plot. But then, within 30 minutes, including commercials, by the end of the show, everything would be neatly resolved and tied up with a bow. And you'd, you'd leave feeling, okay, this is resolved. And I laughed a little bit along the way. And a lot of times, we give sitcom sermons. And, and that doesn't mean that they're bad theology, necessarily. It's just a way of communicating God's truth. It's, it's not bad. A preacher raises an issue, and there's some tension there. But then he, he expounds God's word and, and gives the answer to that and resolves the tension. And even maybe tries to throw in a little bit of humor, right? I mean, I'm not exactly Seinfeld, but I try. And it's all resolved in 30 or 35 minutes, or maybe on a bad day, 45 minutes. And everything's neatly tied together. You won't get that kind of a message from Habakkuk. In fact, you're going to get the exact opposite. Something that perhaps reveal, resembles more real life. Tension drama, real problems, and plenty of unanswered questions about life. Because, my friend, there are simply facets of our lives that cannot be resolved in a 30-minute message. When we're faced with the, the hardest things of life and we're faced with unexpected sorrows or, or deep disappointments, you're, you're expecting to go out and find your dream job after finishing college, but you don't. You always thought that you would be further along in life by now, but you're not. Or you were just sure that your job was secure. It was a very secure job, but it wasn't. And you thought you had a good marriage and that your spouse loved you, but then they left you. You planned on uh, enjoying your retirement and, and spending some more years doing all of those things that you had looked forward to doing. But then severe illness comes and you don't get to. So this is the honest part, that there are situations in life that aren't going to be resolved in 30 minutes, uh, not in three days or in three years, or perhaps not even in this lifetime. We're going to carry that tension throughout this life sometimes. 
And every person who lives this life will sooner or later come to the place where they look up into the sky and they say, why God? Not in an accusatory way necessarily, but in a desperate way, in a, in a real way. You, why even go on? W- what good is any of this even doing, God? How long must I call for help, but you do not listen? And it's this, this complaint, this lament, this is how Habakkuk feels. He's in the middle of an issue, and, and really, you see this all through Scripture. I mean, we're looking at one particular section, but, but the Psalms are full of this. There are entire books dedicated to prayers of this. Lamentations is like this. Job has lots of this. Jeremiah has some of this where biblical writers were expressing honestly their confusion about a God and what he is doing. Even Jesus on the cross, who was the perfect son of God in, in, in every single way, and yet he had a prayer like this. In Matthew 27, when he cried out, he said, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was there on that cross, the most unjust act in the history of the world, that God allowed for a greater purpose. And there, the very Son of God, when, the, when God the Father turned away from His very Son because all of your sins and all of my sins were laid upon Him and He was taking your punishment for you. And it was such a, a horrible thing to look upon the sins of all of humanity laid on His Son, Jesus Christ, that God the Father turned His back on His very Son for you and for me to secure our forgiveness, and our salvation. In a similar way, Habakkuk prays this kind of very honest prayer, and he cries out, Why, God, are you allowing things to happen in this way? You know, the, the name, how, what do we do when this kind of thing happens? And we're going to see what Habakkuk did, but, but really the, 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 the answer is in the very name Habakkuk. And I mentioned before, it's not really a Hebrew word. It's, a, it's another language that you know, became a, an influence in the Hebrew culture. And Habakkuk means to embrace and to wrestle. So, so Habakkuk is doing something that, that a person of faith can do and, and often must face the reality of this. He is embracing God And what he knows to be true about God and the character of God, he has faith in those things, but at the very same time, he is wrestling with what God is doing in his life. And the the apparent uh, injustice of it and the the difficulty of it and the unpleasantness of it, he is wrestling with all of that. So he is at the very same time holding this tension of deep faith in God and struggling to understand why God is doing this, and why God doesn't answer, and why God allows evil people to prosper. Why does God allow society to be the way it is? And so that's what you and I have to do. We have to, we have to embrace, but then we also have to wrestle. And, 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 and that's okay. I, I guess in one way, this is a freeing thing, and, and it's, we're, we're giving ourselves permission based upon the Word of God, to wrestle with God and to wrestle with the circumstances that He has allowed. Now let's see what kind of answer. Not only is the answer in Habakkuk's name, but we also find the answer here in our text. And uh, look at verse 5 with me, if you would. In verse 5, it says, now I want you to look at this verse, because this, is, this is verse is kind of like a, it's so ironic. This verse is very, it's full of irony, because... Uh, Habakkuk cried out to God, and he said, God, why don't you answer? And God, why are you allowing this? And so God finally, ultimately answers, and this is his answer in verse 5. Look among the nations and watch, and be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe. 
though it were told you. He said, Habakkuk, I'm about to do something that you're not even going to believe. And, and, and we read that verse, and that, that sounds like full of hope and full of promise, doesn't it? I mean, that's the kind of verse that they, that they put on coffee mugs and on wall hangings, right? It's that kind of a, of a verse that is like, oh, wow, God's going to do something great, so spectacular, so wonderful, so amazing that I, I'll have, I won't even believe it. That's not where God is going with this statement. Not at all. Habakkuk is already struggling, and what God is about to do is so contrary to Habakkuk's idea of justice and God that God's saying, Habakkuk, if you think you're struggling now, you just wait till I do what I'm about to do, and then you'll really struggle with your ideas of who God is and how God acts. So he's really setting him up for even a harder pill to swallow, you might say. And we see that in verses 6 through 10. Uh, read that with me if you would. It says here, For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Now the Babylonians, they were one of the dominating world empires. And they were, they were known as a very brutal and cruel people when they would conquer uh, a people. And, and of course, uh, previous to this time, Israel had been oppressed by the Assyrians to the north. And the Assyrians were very brutal. The, the Babylonians made the Assyrians look like Boy Scouts. And the Babylonians were very famous for conquering a kingdom. And they would bring the king or the, the ruler before into a public ceremony, and they would gouge his eyes out. But before they would gouge his eyes out, the very last thing that they would see is they would, they would slaughter all of his family members in front of him before they gouged his eyes out so that the very last thing he saw was his family dying. That was the Babylonians. And Habakkuk knew that. And God says, I'm raising them up to punish you, Israel. You're my people, but you have not followed me. You have not kept my covenant. You have not walked in my ways. Your nation, the nation of Israel, is full of violence and full of dishonesty and corruption and immorality. And, and, and so I'm going to raise up a people worse than you to bring judgment upon you. And he goes on. You can read it about yourself. He describes the Babylonians here. And, and really, here's the story. Habakkuk, the people of Israel are kind of bad. These people are much worse. And I know that all of you hate all of them, but I'm going to use them to bring justice and judgment on you. And Habakkuk is like, huh? That's not right. I'm not that bad. That's not fair. How can you use the unrighteous people to bring havoc on the righteous people? That doesn't seem fair, God. So here's the deal. What do we do when what we see isn't consistent with what we believe? And you're not sure what to think about what God is doing. What do you do? You want to believe, but you've got so many questions. Can you still be a deeply committed believer and have questions? And this is exactly what we find in Habakkuk, holding this tension. A, a faithful person with a struggling faith. A, a committed believer who is struggling with their commitment and they're left a little bit unsure. And what does Habakkuk do? He, he, he does two things. He does two things. He embraces and he wrestles. He embraces, God, I still, I'm still going to trust you and I still believe in you. And even though I don't understand what you're doing, I know you. I trust your character. I trust your character that you are a good God, that you are a just God, that you are a wise God. And even though I, I can't square that with everything that I see, I'm trusting your character while I wrestle with all of these difficulties over here. And when you do that, things may not get better. 
They may even get worse. But when you do that, something does happen inside of you. It will take your faith to a place of intimacy and commitment that you have never known before. It will grow your faith and the resiliency, resiliency of your faith. It will draw you closer to God. Someone said before that God, sometimes God brings us to the place where He is the only thing we have in order to show us that He is the only thing we need. And Habakkuk found himself in that place. The New Testament says it this way. Brothers, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. So it may very well be that God has allowed the difficulties in your life that have come, and he's done it as a test of our faith. And, and, and we are being stretched in our faith to trust in God and to realize that sometimes God acts in ways that we wouldn't act. And he allows things in this life and in this world that we don't understand. And Habakkuk has simultaneously, he has faith and he has questions. And I want you to see this because it's really how he ends this passage in, in verses 12 and, and, and on. I want you to read this with me because this is Habakkuk's prayer. After God has, first he went to God with this complaint and this lament. God, I don't understand. And then God actually came back with, with more drastic circumstances that are on their way that just blew his mind completely. And I, and I hope the irony of this passage and our current events is not lost on you. I hope it's not. Because I know there are people uh, listening to me now that you are struggling with the politics and the, uh, the events and the civil events of our society. And is there injustice? Oh yeah, there's mountains of injustice. Now, I, always, I lived in a third world developing country. I, I've, been, I've traveled some, so I always have to give the caveat. Uh, there is so much more injustice in other parts of the world. We have a lot of justice, but my friends, we have a lot of injustice. And you see that and you think, wow, this is terrible. This can't go on. Actually, it can go on. It could even get worse. And where is that going to leave your faith? I, you know, I said, this is not a sitcom sermon. I'm not going to resolve all of our nation's issues in this message. My, that's not my goal. My goal is to... Uh, give you some tools to build a resilient faith and, and, and give you the freedom that you can believe in God and still struggle. And you can be a person of deep faith, Habakkuk was, and still question and not understand and walk out of the room shaking your head. That's okay. We see it right here in verse 12. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God and my Holy One? We shall not die. Now that, my friends, is a statement of deep faith. He's saying, I believe in you, God, that you are the eternal God, that you are holy. You're not unjust. You're so much greater. You are holy, and we shall not die. God, even if these horrible things come to pass as you've said they would, my faith is in you and my faith is in eternity. And I know that I am secure in your hands, whatever befalls me in this life. My faith is firmly planted in you. This is a statement of faith. But then the questions begin. He says, Oh Lord, you have appointed them for judgment, O oh rock. You have marked them out for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why? Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? Why do you hold your tongue when the wicked devours a, poor, a person more righteous than he? So he had questions. He didn't understand 
why God was going to do things the way he was going to do them or why he was in that moment, but he had faith in God. And some of you, that's where perhaps you are right now. You're in chapter 1, and, and you've got bad news. And, and, you know, chapter 1 leaves Habakkuk wondering. He's kind of questioning why. When we get into chapter 2, it doesn't really get a lot better. Habakkuk is left waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting for God to act, and he's waiting. But finally, when we end up in chapter 3, we find Habakkuk, and he is worshiping. He is worshiping a God that is so much bigger and so much greater than his mind can in that moment understand or comprehend. And my friend, that's what you have to do. What do you do when your life doesn't seem to make any sense at all? You know what you do? You Habakkuk. That's what you do. You Habakkuk. You embrace and you struggle. That's what you do. Let's bow together for prayer. Just with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. You know, I think it's very providential that today we're observing communion. And even as there's so much going on in our life and in our world, we come today to a deep act of worship. Would you pray?